Welcome to the Taproom Exclusive. I'm your host, Dean Zarbaugh. Today's show is sponsored by House of Helga. Are you a brewery looking for some vibrant, stunning artwork to slap on that freshly bottled or canned beer? Or maybe you're a new brewery starting out and need help coming up with a logo. If so, contact House of Helga for all your design needs. They've worked with Masthead, Streetside, and yours truly here at the Taproom Exclusive. You can check out Kyla's entire portfolio of incredible work at houseohelga.com. On today's show, I chat with Missing Falls Breweries brewer and co-founder Mark Cernak and co-founder Will Myers over their tasty Mango Rehab IPA. But first, a taste of what's going on in the craft beer world with this week's Tasting Glass, brought to you by Northeast Ohio Craft Brewery News. Be sure to join me at Collision Bend this Thursday, September 26th at 5 p.m. for the tapping of our collaboration small batch double IPA called the Taproom Exclusive. Clocking in at 8.3% ABV, this double IPA will only be available at Collision Bend for a limited time, so don't miss out. Collision Bend is located at 1250 Old River Road in the east bank of the Flats. Thank you for having me out, and I can't wait to try the beer. Mark Bona of Cleveland.com has the details on the first tapping of Great Lakes Christmas Ale. The tapping will occur on Thursday, October 24th. Santa will deliver the keg at 11 a.m., and the tapping will begin a half hour later at 11.30. For a full list of details on the annual Cleveland tradition, check out Mark's article on cleveland.com. Rick Arman of Ohio.com and the Akron Beacon Journal is reporting that March 1st Manufacturing, which is the parent company of March 1st Brewing in Cincinnati, has acquired Middleton-based Fig Leaf Brewing. For full details on this story, check out Rick's article on ohio.com. And that's all for this week's Tasting Glass. My interview with Mark and Will from Missing Falls Brewery in Akron, Ohio is up next. And with that, I wanted to let you all know that the show will be taking a hiatus for the month of October, but I will be back in November with a pretty awesome brewery. And without further ado, here's Mark and Will. Welcome to the Tap Room Exclusive. I'm Dean Zarbaugh here at Missing Falls. I'm with Mark Cernak and Will Myers. Got that right. Uh, I've been having a couple, so some stuff slips through the cracks. Uh, we have moved on to the Mango Rehab. Uh, this is a American IPA. Tell people a little bit about this. This took a little bit of evolution to it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. This beer started many, many years ago with me when West Coast IPAs were just sort of you know breaking the horizon. And I was like, I want to make a West Coast IPA. So the original run recipes, it was a, pretty much a basic, nice, citrusy West Coast IPA. And then I started working a bit with the uh, Galaxy Hops, and they started, you know, giving it a little bit of a mango passion fruit overtone. Okay. So I adjusted the hop structure and worked it from there, and I was working it as a tropical IPA at that time, and all, all my friends seemed to love it. It was really still a good, solid IPA. And then I uh, got an idea to start, you know, soaking it on some mangoes, try to get some more mango flavor in there and that really worked out well so it became a mango tropical IP okay. for a while there and along with it the names changed as it went. Right. Um, the reason I decided to start using habanero, one of my favorite chicken wing sauces was BW3's mango habanero sauce. Nice. So I was kind of like, you know what, maybe I should throw it. And this was right when everybody was putting peppers and hot spices in the beers. I was like, maybe I should put some habanero in there. So I, we gave it a try, and the first run was a bit hot, and we had to figure out what to do or how to work with the habanero. So we developed a technique that actually allows the capsin oil to separate from the habanero pulp, and we can kind of get that to the side and just use the pulp you know, in the brewing process and from the fermentation process. And then we're able to put just a little bit of that heat back in so it's not a huge heat signature. I didn't want a pepper beer that was a one and done where pepper is the forefront character, but I definitely wanted the roastiness of the habanero to be in there, along with a little bit of that heat signature, but nothing overpowering. Yeah. But, I mean, it took practice. I know when me and Will first tried figuring out the techniques with the habaneros, we inadvertently maced ourselves in the kitchen. Yes. Which was um, made me cry. a huge learning experience that uh, atomized capsaicin and habanero oils are not the best thing to inhale, point blank. Uh, ah, yeah. Oh. And that it, just sounds, yeah. that just does not sound fun. It was, uh, the day continued for me because I wasn't 
paying attention too much to working with the habaneros, so I wasn't wearing gloves. I figured, oh, no. I figured I'd wash my hands enough, which I did, and then we brewed that day, so I was yeah. working with all the cleansers and the sanitizers. Right. And then I, you know, showered at night, me and my wife went out and had dinner, and while well, the night turned to an end, I went to go take my contacts out, and to my surprise, that oil was still there in full force. Oh. And I ended up macing my one eyeball, and it really hurt. So I knew I had to get the other contact out, and that's not just going to fall out. So right. I'd, I'd be quick about it. I ended up poking myself in the eye and not getting the contact, <sighs> getting the, the habanero oil in there again. So at that point, I was hurting, so he's just get in there and rip it out. I figured I'd be able to clean the contacts, let them soak overnight, we'd be fine. No. No, I started off Monday morning with just macing myself again with the, <laughs> the pre-existing contacts. Oh, my God. So I'd uh, pretty much abort, throw everything away and start fresh new contacts, put on, you know, be- surgical gloves to put them in. Yeah. I wasn't even sure if this oil was still on my skin or not. Oh, man. Now, now, from now on, it's a double glove rule when working with the habaneros. No touching yourself. Um, we've adapted a lot to the, the process and not the discovery of the process. There's, you know, there's a, there's a learning curve uh, to a pa- things. Painful one. And sometimes, yeah, like you said, this is a little bit more painful this time yeah, around. Nonetheless, we ended up with a final beer that was, uh, we loved it. It has a huge mango head note. You get a lot of that tropical fruit on the first sip, and then the hops hit you, and it follows up like a traditional West Coast IPA. And then in the finish, on the first sh- sip, you're not sure, but you taste something different. Right. Second sip tingles a little in the back of your throat, and that's because the minute amounts of capsin oil that are in the beer slowly adhere to the back of your throat. So if you were to do a little sip after little sip after little sip, that heat signature would keep growing because right. you're not washing it down. So it, it worked out great. We loved it, and it was just named Mango Habanero IPA. And one thing we started noticing is that people wouldn't buy it because of the word habanero. They're like, no, nah, it's got habanero. I, I don't want it. Because they've had those, you know, overly strong pepper yeah. beers, which that's what the brewer is going for, but unbeknownst to the consumer, that got their attention. Right. So with us, I had to change the name to Mango Rehab sort of has the word habanero in there yeah. and by design it's got the longest description on the menu with only the last word saying a warm finish never says heat or right. too much to it to kind of if somebody reads far enough into it maybe they'll give it a try yeah um what we've noticed though a lot of people do taste the pepper but are unaware of it at the first couple of sips and then when they realize it they, they realize that they do enjoy the taste of habanero, just not the heat level of habanero. Right. It's one of our better selling beers. Yeah, it's a definitely a great selling beer. It's continuously will be on draft, and this is another one that's on its way to Colorado, if not oh, there nice. already. And so, like, with this, like you were saying, sometimes you get them, and there's the, they're like the pepper IPAs or the pepper beers, and that's fine. Yeah. That's what you're setting out to make? Good. Uh, but this one, you know, it really doesn't have the the tinge of the heat that a lot of beers with habanero have, yeah. and it's a really big testament to the fact that this it's a really well made beer. Yeah, and that was also a lot by design. Is I like the the spicier beers too, but I consider them one and done beers. I mean, as a consumer, I'm not going to have one after another, three or four of a sitting while watching the game. Right. I'll have one and then I'll move to something else. So as a brewer, i got to consider the amount of kegs that I'll make of that, the amount of space it takes in the cooler, the days it sits in the cooler, the cost to keep in it cold. I wanted a beer that would hit the IPA side, hit the tropical side, and also finish you with a little bit of warm heat in there. And, and you, you nailed it. Yeah. After I mean, how many tries? It took 27 adaptations as a home brewer to finally figure this one out. But you got to stick with it sometimes to get... To, to get gold. Yeah, it was probably about two years of working on it. it. It's a it's a really good beer. You know, like I said, there's like beers with jalapeno or beer with habanero, and sometimes the pepper just becomes a little too dominant. But yeah. it, it's not like that in this one. Like, had you told me, had you not told me that there was habanero in it, I, I probably wouldn't have known. Mm-hmm. Um, I might have asked what this extra little bit is. But it's a really interesting, in a good way, flavor that that just kind of 
adds a complexity to to the beer itself. Yes. Like as good as this as this would be as a plain IPA, yeah, it's it just knocks it up that extra level with yeah, that I, habanero. I know we've thought of just running the base run of the beer minus the additions of the mango and habanero, and seeing what we could do with that. But that's you know that's sort of just you know not really representing it as we designed it so you know if we want to do that we might as well just come up with another come up with recipe, recipe and make a completely different beer that'll stand on its own and not just be a deconstructed version of what it was absolutely because it, it might not even be fun for you to make it at that point you know if you're just doing the same thing but it's always fun you know what to I mean? brew it's always fun to well, brew. That's true. I, I, I've I, never done it. Yeah, a day brewing. I'm about to for the first time, but it's work a day brewing, but you brew it. Right. <laughs> you know, you're making you're beer. making beer. So you you could be doing a lot worse things on your day. Oh, absolutely, you definitely could be. I don't have the patience that you guys have. Yeah. I've said this many times on the show. I I get frustrated over the smallest things. Like if I just turned turn something wrong and something, I would just get so frustrated with myself that. It, I let let it be to the professionals uh, to to do the brewing to deal with that because it's not my thing. But a kudos to you guys for for being able to deal with the the different amount of pressures that you have to deal with in, on a brew day. Definitely, it's it's hard work, man. It's fun work, though. It's, it's, it's fun. It, it's it's fun. I think the best part is when you see the customer's reaction, and you know you see something that you look back at yourself and you're like, man. We, we were in my garage just talking, just pipe dreaming this, just right. talking, saying what if, what if. And now look at it, we're handing flights out. You know, people are buying our beer, they're talking about us on you know, social media, we've been in some magazines, and you're like, wow, this is really cool. Never, never did you think your garage hobby could turn into you know, something that actual people enjoy. It's the American dream, man. It is, it is. Uh, not the easiest to, to achieve, but not impossible at all. It's just you got to put in you got to put in the legwork. You got to put in the hours. It's and that's the thing is a lot of people don't realize when they go and start into this is they they don't realize the work that goes into it and by the end of it they're just like, mm, "Is this really what I wanted to do?" Yeah. But it seems like uh, you guys knew right off the bat everything you guys would be doing and you prepared for it. Yeah, for us it was really really stressful. Uh, there was a lot of what ifs, a lot of questions, but I think a lot was answered on opening night, which um, fortunately for us, that opening night was the Ohio State-Michigan game. Oh, you can't ask for and, better than that. And you know what? Uh, we are so fortunate that Ohio State took care of Michigan because had that went the other way, I've worked in a lot of sports bars, and when your team doesn't win, people don't want to hang around. There's, a, there's that superstition yeah. aspect of it that, uh, that sports fans have. Oh, well, yeah. We are, like I said, we're currently really looking forward to this upcoming Brown season. It's going to uh, be nuts. We've got our fingers really crossed on an Indians postseason, too. Yeah. Me, too. Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at it. We just... Uh, Probably wild card. Well, no. We need them. To, we need them I, I want to go, them. We need the Twins to go on a losing streak, even though they got a pretty easy yeah. schedule here on out. Yeah, we, we they need do. A losing streak for the and we have a pretty tough one too. Yeah. So, but well, except, think, except for Detroit. We're Detroit, yeah, yeah, which we've won the 14th consecutive. So go us. Yeah. But yeah, we, we got the Twins, and we got what, a four game series with them. So if we hopefully, can, if we yeah. can do well with that series, there's a chance of us getting the division for De- sure. Definitely, definitely. But it, it's it's definitely helped us. Um, of course, winning teams help when people come out to watch. Them. Absolutely. Uh, I I think we offer a lot of great stuff for the sports fan at the brewery and for a craft beer enthusiast. You know, that would like to stop it and also. for the and for the non craft I mean, you have non uh, non alcoholic options that for people who, if it's family and yeah, something that probably, doesn't drink, we, I don't know how many different sodas and waters we have available, but it's got to be upward of what like twelve to thirteen. And that's a nice selection. We've I got mean, every diet version, every regular version. Then we got like the old school orange soda or grape soda. Right. If you're feeling like you know what, you, it's a summer Being picnic. A you know, we got ginger rails and iced teas and expensive waters that are carbonated, which I, honestly I don't get. Right. But it, it, to each their own. If I knew carbonated water would sell, this really would have sped up my brewing process. <laughs> yeah. Right? I really would have. Absolutely. Fil- a filter and a bright tank is all I'd need. That's funny. <laughs> Uh, anything else you wanted to get out about Missing Falls or the uh, Mango Rehab before we move on to the Between Two Hops segment? 
Uh, no, but definitely check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, website's out there, missingfalls.com. Uh, check us out. Stop on down to Akron. Let's uh, make Akron the brewing destination it needs to be. Absolutely. The food's great. The beer's great. I can't recommend Missing Falls enough. Seriously, people get down here. Uh, we are moving on to a segment called Between Two Hops. It's inspired by the Inside the Actor Studio questionnaire at the end of the Inside the Actor Studio. Uh, but it's a little more craft beer related. Right. So question number one, what is your favorite style of beer to brew and to drink? I don't know. I like, I like brewing all, all, all the styles. It's on the brewing process. A lot's the same, you know, uh, I'd have to say the really hoppy IPAs cause it's, it's a challenge watching the clock. Uh, making sure everything's right um, with the multiple dry hops, you know, keeping everything going, getting the beer to clarify out. I, and then at the end, when you end up with like we do with Seven Seas, you're just, you know, really proud of what you did because it's it's not one of those brew days where you got like two hop additions and you got some time to sit down and have a pizza <laughs> while everything's going on. I mean, there's maybe with seven C's, we get a break for about six and a half minutes in between right. editions. Wow. They, they run throughout the whole course. I like the seven C's brew because the aroma in the brewery alone yeah. from all those hops is nice. just incredible. Now, it, the smell when, when brewing is, is unparalleled, in my opinion. Uh, on the opposite end of that spectrum, what's the least favorite style of beer to brew and to drink for you? Uh, right now, my least favorite style to brew was, uh, we were talking about this during the commercial break, was an IPA that I've been working on for many years that I've never been successful at, which is called Enigma, Yeah. which is a rapidly, continuously hopped beer. It was supposed to be insanely hoppy, but I've just never had luck with uh, it, it finishing out or it would take an infestation or it would get contaminated, and this was all on... A homebrew level where the sanitation that sometimes was hit and miss. Right. But those there are, I mean, when you're, you're dumping batch after batch after unsuccessful try, it's it's Ooh. tough to swallow after a yeah. while. And you never really got to taste what it's supposed to taste like. Yeah. It's your, it's your white whale. Yep. yep. <laughs> like, we'll, uh, we'll solve it someday. You'll get there. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, retirement. <laughs> definitely, answer. definitely retirement. Um, I, I have a day profession. I'm a union sprinkler fitter by trade, and I've been doing that for many years. Uh, I've got experience doing that while I was in the United States Navy. So I really enjoy doing my day job, or I wouldn't have done it for that long. Right. It, it is blue collar, it is work, but at the end of the day, you look back at what you did and you know, you got something to show for a day's work. So puts food on the table. It definitely does, and I was, I was able to live a really good life working. Absolutely. So I, I definitely probably look into the skilled trades if I could do anything. If I could change what I do, I'd like to be a welder because that that just looks cool. Yeah. Right. You know, do an underwater welder? No, no, that, no. I'm, I'm good up here. You're no. I'm good all with right. oxygen. I don't need all the okay. danger. I can. I can that take. Was, the, I, I can take the pay cut. Just take the base. I weight. asked I'm someone good. on this segment one time what they what the profession they would like to attempt. They literally their answer was underwater welder. Yeah, that's just. That's like. Oh, okay. Wow. That that's a very specific answer. I mean, other than a near-death experience at five at the YMCA, I haven't been underwater for a long time. Oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, I've been on the water for four years on a ship. Right. I like the like, difference being up here. Yeah, I, I like I like the air. I'll, I'll stay on this side. Absolutely. Uh, what profession would you not like to attempt? Oh man, I don't know. Probably a doctor. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. It just seems too stressful. I mean, if I have a bad day in my day job, I get water on the floor. Yeah, something leaks. Yeah, if you have a bad day, you know, as a doctor, you, it could be a lot worse. You Absolutely, know, you're not just going to have to run and get a mop. Right, and explain to the maintenance that hey, uh, this baseboard may need replaced. Sorry. Right. Yeah, little 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 different uh, degrees of of uh, stuff going on. Uh, what hurdles did you personally face? And how did you overcome them, opening the missing calls? Oh, man, numerous. Um, started off just me and Will, 
and I was going around just feeling the waters, talking to banks, because I knew that a, a loan would be necessary. We don't come from rich families or have trust funds or you know have a bunch of. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a tradesman, so I don't have a ton of money sitting right. around. Um, but just going around bank to bank and getting no after no. I mean, just sitting down talking with one of the loan officers and saying, hey, um, I, I know I'm new at this process, but if I, you know, I'm looking for a startup business loan, does your bank offer anything you know, to help with that yeah. for a startup business? And due to the way people handled their business loans in the past, banks have sort of really restructured all that, so they're not going to be on the losing end right. anymore. So the, most banks just told me, no, wow. you don't do startup loans. Now, if you have an existing business and you can show proof of profit, they're more than willing to give you a loan because you now have you know, assets to put up on the line. Right. I mean, I went as far as talking to an Amish guy at an Amish bank in Sugar Creek to get a loan. Wow. And he still turned me down. So it was a tough business. It was man. a tough hurdle, and we ended up um, writing our own business plan and submitting it to the SBA board, and they backed us. So with their backing, uh, one bank, who's the SBA leader of lending, was a little more willing to work with us based on they knew that at end game, if we didn't succeed, that our end of the loan that we borrowed was covered because the government would reimburse them on that and they would take control of the property. Gotcha. So it's kind of like we had a big brother to back us. I mean, you know, we don't ever want to use that. But right. That, that helped with the loan process. Uh, that got your foot in the door, but there was still months and months after that where you had to prove yourself through your business plan and through... Oh man, a stack of paperwork that yeah. that seems like we filled out at least ten times over and over and over the same that one. Sucks. I don't I don't know why they didn't Xerox it or scan right. it, but uh, it, it's what it took. But you know, finally we did get it in. I think that was the hugest obstacle because I knew it stood in our way because without the money everything fell through. But you had to line up so much first. You had to have so many balls in the air. You had to have property that you could prove. This this place here. We had to have a tentative lease sign. You know, good faith contracts. Uh, we had to go out to different uh, establishments and get good faith contracts from them that they put our beer on draft. You know, sight on scene without even trying. Uh, the numbers had to work out. It was a lot of work and a lot of hours just getting the business plan. And then we ended up short, just with everything in it. We were still $20,000 short, so we did a Kickstarter campaign, which put us over the top of where we needed to be. And that was, you know, that was the biggest hurdle, was getting the funding to open up the business. There was no book or manual that says, here's how to open up a business. Right. There's no one person you can ask. There's a, like, a labyrinth of people that you've got to go ask on different aspects and then once the business is open there's more layers that hit there you start dealing with work that's comp and taxes right. and payroll and, but it, it's all a learning experience and if you're willing to learn it's not impossible absolutely what was the most interesting trend you saw in 2018 2019 uh, I don't I I don't know if it was in you know, 2019 still new I wouldn't say it was interesting because I personally didn't care for the style myself, but it would have been the Brute IPA. Okay. I don't, I don't even know why that was a thing. I don't know why that happened. I tried a few of them and I just, I just couldn't get aboard. To each their own. You know, I, I understand that it's, I don't know if it's a recognized you know, judging style, but I do know that it is a style that was out there. I've seen less and less of it. It didn't take off quite like the hazies. No, no. I think it, it, it sort of had the launch that the IPL had. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, it was, it was, let's throw it against the wall, see how long it sticks. It didn't yep. stick, and everyone's just kind of like, yep, not, I'm not going there. No, not a fan. Uh, <clears throat> what is one piece of practical advice you would give to someone starting out? Don't take no for an answer. Open a kitchen. And open a kitchen. Definitely... Um, we started out with a kitchen in mind. We 
in a series of issues we had, we had some logistical issues with the kitchen, which ended up being resolved in time. So for a while there, we did have to run food trucks and guest chefs, and it seemed great at the time, and people were here, but when we opened the kitchen, and at the end of the day, when you looked at the numbers, you were like, my God, why didn't we open this kitchen sooner? Everyone that sits down gets something to eat, nice. and we were sending them away. You know, wow. or, or you know, because food trucks in the winter time, there's it's not hard. not a lot running. Yeah. So it's it's hard to find people that are willing to come out on a gamble. Yeah, that, absolutely. You, know, you may or may not have a crowd that night. Absolutely. But for advice, definitely don't take a no. You're going to get a lot of that. You're going to get no's from everybody. Just don't take a no. Figure out how you can make that a yes. Just be persistent. I mean, I, we probably bugged the same bank. 40, 50 times, and then they're finally like, all right, enough. Yeah. Quit calling us, fool. Fine, we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to be persistent. You've got to show the passion in what you do. And be, ser- be serious about it if you're going to do it. Don't go halfway and just throw in the towel, because there's a lot of other guys that would like to be halfway. 100%. 100%. What, uh, if you could send a message to yourself 10 years ago, what would you tell the younger you? Oh, jeez. Quit using pipe wrenches so you have shoulders and wrists when you're 10 years, 10 years older from now. The problem, uh, don't be so hard on your body. Yeah. I mean, t- I was brewing 10 years ago, and I, I guarantee 10 years ago I had this dream. So this is always a work in progress. I mean, it's just getting off, you know, just making the dream a reality is the hard stuff. But right. I, for me, I'd say just to be easier on myself. I mean, I'm... I'm getting up there now, and I'm noticing the pains, and I'm just like, wow, I need a few surgeries to get back to normal, and I don't know when I'm going to get that. Right. But I'd have to tell myself just to be easier. When I was in the trade when I was younger, I was kind of gung-ho, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of a lot of enforced safety or OSHA rules when I was coming up, so it was pretty much, you know, the guys that trained me were like, hey, kid, pick that up. Hey, kid, grab this. Hey, kid. You know, so you're an apprentice, you do what you're told, and you leap. You know, and I, heck, I was, I was in my 30s then, so I still had a little more energy than I do now. Yeah, absolutely. And the last question, what or who has been the biggest influence in your brewing career? Wow. Uh, I would probably have to say the guys I work with now. The, the team that I've assembled, uh, they, they honestly show as much passion and drive that I've had for this whole project from the beginning. And it's a huge leap of faith to jump on one of my ideas and say, yeah, let, let me sign where I put my house up right. at. You know, right. that's, that's a huge trust that was instilled on me, and I, I think I proved it to them based on you know, the home brewing end and how serious we were about it but also with the drive and, you know, what we're doing with the business now. Absolutely. So I definitely have to be the people that I, that I wanted to work with me on this project. Very cool. Anything else you want to get out about Missing Falls before we head out? Oh, we do have uh, a couple hour changes on there. So on Saturdays and Sundays, we're now going to be open at 11 a.m. And we're going to be serving brunch from 11 a.m. till... One on Saturdays. Till one on Saturdays and, on Sundays. and two on Sundays. We've got a completely new brunch menu we've got english burritos breakfast pizzas breakfast sandwiches got all kinds of good stuff on there new menu rolls out uh tomorrow very cool thank you guys so much for your time enjoy the rest of your day and thank you all for tuning in tune in next time for another all-new episode here on the taproom exclusive